Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Donna Michi and June Dupre in Alexander Graham Bell. Ladies and gentlemen, your guest producer, Mr. Mitchell Lyson. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Since last Monday night, our country has shared in the great victory in Europe. Yesterday, in keeping with President Truman's wishes, America offered up its thanks to Almighty God for this great step toward universal peace. And now, through work and prayer, we are dedicating ourselves, each in his own allotted task, wherever we may be, to a victorious prosecution of the war with Japan, so the complete peace may come soon. In the past few days especially, the telephone wires of the world have performed a momentous service in distributing the news. At the San Francisco Conference, an international exchange is handling over a dozen switchboards, 12 to 15,000 calls a day in 45 languages, which gives you some idea of the posthumous role that Alexander Graham Bell is playing in the world today. Our play tonight from the 20th Century Fox screen epic is The Life of Alexander Graham Bell with Don Amici in the title role that he made famous on the screen. With Don Amici is the lovely and appealing June Dupre as the fiancé and wife who helped the impetuous young inventor through those early years of trial and triumph, failure and success. In a sense, our story is the saga of America with its opportunity for achievement in this free and fair land. The American urge toward better and better ways of doing things. And among the many little things that we do better are such modern economical conveniences as Lux Flakes. Indeed, it is your recognition of this fact and your continued use of Lux Flakes for your dishes and washables that raises this curtain every Monday night and that presents this evening Alexander Graham Bell with Don Amici in the title role and June Dupre as Mabel Hubbard. Our curtain rises on the first act. It's a wintry evening in Boston, 1873. On the top floor of a Newton Street boarding house, a little boy, deaf and dumb, is lying in bed. He is George Sandy. Though he can't speak, his eyes shine and he smiles broadly, for he's having visitors. His father and two other men. There now, Mr. Sanders. George will be wide awake in just a minute. Thank you, nurse. Oh, my boy, you're glad to see me, aren't you? Didn't you think I was coming tonight? How old is the boy, Miss Bell? He's eight, Mr. Hubbard. He's been living here several weeks. That way I can work with him much more closely. He's never spoken a word? No, sir, never. He was born a deaf mute. I came here tonight with Mr. Sanders because of what he's told me about you. About your being able to speak to his boy. I do it by means of this club. Club? Yes. You see, it has all the letters of the alphabet on it. I'll show you what I mean. Uh, George and I are going to talk, Mr. Sanders. It's amazing, Hubbard. Amazing. Now, I'll just turn his head toward me. Look at that smile. Now, spell out something with the letters on the glove. He's, he's shaking my hand. Yes, that's what I asked him to do. Now, something else. He's nodding his head, yes. I asked him if I should tell Mr. Hubbard about our glove. Well, I began by teaching George how to spell simple words like C-A-T and then showing him a cat. <laughs> now, by touching the letters on the glove, I can talk to George almost as rapidly as I can talk to you. But I understood you were teaching him to actually speak. Well, watch this. Uh, uh, you see, uh, Hubbard, the boy can utter sound. Tell me, Bell, have you ever succeeded in teaching a deaf mute to speak? No, but, but I have great hopes. I have a little girl, Mr. Bell. Perhaps you could help her. She had scarlet fever when she was four years old. It left a stone deaf. She's learned to read lips perfectly, well, I'm but... I'm sorry, sir, but when I'm not working with George, I spend all my time on my multiple telegraph. Multiple telegraph. If it ever works, I'll be able to send 50 messages at one time over one wire. Get him interested, Alec, and your financial worries are over. Well, I'd be delighted to explain it to you, Mr. Hubbard. My rooms are just across the hall. I'm afraid I'm more interested in your work with the deaf. You'll have supper with us Saturday night. We'll talk about it. Well, I, I don't I hope you I... like beans. Boston baked beans. Oh, I hate beans. And besides... Come I, on, I don't... Sanders. It's exactly two and a half minutes past nine. Never mind, Alec. You'll have a fine chance to tell him about your experiment. Well, yes, but I, I just... Well, maybe if I... Brought my telegraph instrument along. Of course. I'll say good night to George. Hey, what's going on around here? Hey, you see, Mister, we're clean up. Better watch out. We sure go fast down this hill. And exactly where am I supposed to 
sidewalk. I try to know, mister. Can you tell me which is Mr. Hubbard's house? Down in the next block. It's... Hey, watch out. Hey, look out. Gangway. What, uh, look you, out. you mean me? Hey, hey. Hey, look out. But I can't. I can't. Oh, I'm very sorry, but I, I shouted. Yes, I'm perfectly aware you shouted. You were all ten feet away going 40 miles an hour, and you were thoughtful enough to shout at me. Thank you. Oh, dear. The snow got down your neck? Yes, that's a logical result, diving headfirst into a snowbank. Are you hurt? Oh, no. Do you realize what you might have done? This box, you might have ruined the most important piece of electrical equipment in the city of Boston. Did I? Well, no, I, I don't think so. Oh. The sidewalk is no place for sleds. Little children don't understand that, but it seems to me that a young lady, a grown young lady, so would have more... say? Would you mind speaking a little more distinctly? Madam, I come from a long line of elocution teachers. My father wrote books on the subject. I think I know when I'm speaking distinctly. Good evening. I, I'm sorry, but you see, Good I... evening. No, I thought I'd bring my apparatus along, Mr. Hubbard, just, just in case you'd like it explained. Yes, it uh, must be very interesting. Mother! Yes, Governor? Mother, it's exactly 26 minutes past 6 o'clock. You'll uh, notice these tuned reeds, Mr. Hubbard. They're made of flattened steel clock springs, one end of which is attached to the poles of these electric magnets, while the other end is free to vibrate over the other poles. Oh, come in. Come in, girls. Uh, Mr. Bell, these are my little girls. Your little... Oh, but I, I thought you had... This is Gertrude. Hello. Berta. How do you do? Grace. Do you do? And this one is Mabel. Well, I... Oh. Well, how do you do? Now run along, ladies. Run along. Supper time. Oh, uh, uh, Mabel. Oh, Papa's calling, Mabel. Yes, Papa. Mr. Bell, this is the little girl I was telling you about. Mr. Bell and I already met Papa on the street. I knocked him down. I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Bell. He makes things, Mabel. He was telling me about his telegraph. Oh, please go on, Mr. Bell. Well, uh, I was Oh, you say... must look at me when you speak, Mr. Bell. Otherwise, I, I can't see your lips. Oh, uh, forgive me. Well, when the steel spring transmits its electrical tone into the wire here, theoretically only its mate in the receiver should respond. And I, I'm sorry if I said anything out in the street to offend you, Miss Hubbard. Huh? Oh, but you didn't, and, and do go on. Well, it's rather technical, and besides... Besides what? It may not work. Oh, there's a realistic young man. Oh, but it will work. I'm sure it will. Papa, supper's ready. This is the third successive night that supper has been between three and five minutes late. Coming, Mr. Bell? What? Oh, yes, yes. And I hope you like baked beans. Lots of baked beans. Oh, I, I love baked beans. Did you, uh, did you say something, Gertrude? I said you brushed your hair enough. Now hurry up and come to bed. I'm coming. Gertrude, don't you think he has a very nice face? Papa? You know very well whom I mean. Mr. Bell? Oh, I thought he looked all right for a plain man. His eyes, he... He has such nice eyes. They get all full of sparks when he talks. Oh, Mabel Hubbard. Gertrude, oh, please. Well, I'll say this much. He certainly hypnotized Papa. Imagine our Papa putting money into a, into a telegraph, agreeing to pay for his experiments. Gertrude. What? Do you think he'll like me? I mean... I mean, if, even if I can't... If I'm dead? Oh, of course he will. And that'll make him like you ten times as much. Then I'm going to marry him. What? I knew it the minute I saw him lying in the snowbank after I knocked him down. But what'll Papa say? Papa? Oh, I'll just close my eyes and then I won't see his lips and I won't be able to hear what he says. Besides, Papa mustn't know yet. Well, Mr. Bell's coming for supper again Monday night. Yes, but nobody must know yet. Oh, all right. I won't tell. But you've got to promise to tell me everything Mr. Bell says and does. Everything? Everything. Mabel? Hmm? You know, if you hadn't married him, I would. Oh, Gertie. Gertie. I think this is the nicest day we've had all spring, Mr. Bell, don't you? Yes, yes, it's, uh, it's a very nice day. It's an anniversary, too. For the first time you came to our house was the 3rd of December, and today is the 3rd of May. Is it? I'm sorry, Mr. Bell, but you, you'll have to look at me or I can't see what you're saying. Oh, I'm so sorry. Whoa. Whoa, whoa. Why don't you tell me what's wrong? You've hardly spoken a word since we started. Oh, Miss Hubbard, it, it's just that... Well, I, I, I've been thinking. About your telegraph? No. 
It's another idea. It's been rattling around in my head for months. Would you tell me about it? Well, it, it sounds kind of crazy, but if I could make a current of electricity vary in intensity as the air varies in density when sound passes through it, then, then I could transmit sound, even speech, telegraphically. I, I'm sorry, but I, I don't understand. Well, what I mean is I could talk through a wire. Oh, but that's not possible. Why, that, that would be talking through a wire. Oh, yes, that's what I said. There's a friend of mine who's going to help me, Thomas Watson. He's an electrician. Mr. Bell, if you spend all your time working on this, how will you live? Oh, I'll manage somehow. But don't think I'm going to use your father's money for anything but the telegraph. Oh, no. I'm going to work on this new idea in my spare time. That's trouble. See, it may take years before I get anywhere with it. Yes? I suppose I, uh, suppose I don't want to wait that long. There's so many things I want to do now while, while I'm still young. What sort of things, Mr. Bell? What? Oh, I don't know. A wife, a home. Make the wires talk, Mr. Bell. The wife will wait. She will? Oh, yes, Alec. I'm sure she will. Oh, thank you. That, that, that's all I wanted to know. Uh, come on, come on, horse. Get up. Get up. Mabel, it's after supper time. For the most glorious ride in the world. Oh, Gertrude, I'm so happy. Well, you better tell Papa you're home. No, not yet. I feel too good. Oh, we talked so much, and finally it got dark, and Alec had to stop the buggy on the street lamp so I could see what he was saying. Well, what did he say? Oh, the most exciting thing. He said it? He said that he loves you? No, not exactly that. Oh, then what? Well, he he's going to invent something. Alec's going to make wires talk. He's going to make wires talk. But he can't say I love you. But he does, Gertrude. I know he does. Oh, I know he does, too, darling. Alec Bell. Mrs. Alexander Graham Bell. Let's try it again, Tom. Are those wires stretched out? Yep. As far as they'll go. Well, you stay on that side of the room with the transmitter. Start vibrating the print. Honestly, I'm no genius, Alec. I'm just a plain, ordinary fella. I didn't go to bed at all last night. I like to sleep. What's in the world? What's in... No, I... I've got a tattle and piece of metal. Stop muttering. We may be on the verge of a great discovery. Only we can't make up our minds what we want to discover. Multiple telegraph or how to talk through a wire. Tom, come here. See these brass strings? I can only find four. Oh? There's just enough money for five. Twenty-five cents each. Where's that other one? I ate it, Alec. You did what? I didn't mean to. I was just walking along the street, and then I saw that food in the window. I tried not to go in, but I just couldn't stand it. You ate one of my springs. You took our last 25 cents to fill your miserable little stomach. Go on, get back the transmitter. Oh, yes, I did. I'm through, Star. I'll go after the Indian territory. Live on Buffalo State. All right, go. You want me to keep this thing vibrating? Yes, yes. Furthermore, it was my money as much as yours. Wait. Wait. What? Don't, don't, don't touch a thing. I didn't do it. What did you just do? The string stopped vibrating and I just plucked it. It was like an old music. And it came through this wire. Well, this, this, this contract, this screw got stuck and I, I just snapped it. You just, what, while the circuit was unbroken? I suppose so. Then that strip of magnetized steel was generating its own current. Do it again. Wait, uh, no, no, wait, wait a minute. All right, now, do it now. It works. I heard it again. Tom, we found it. What we've been looking for, an undulating current. For the first time in history, we've sent sound through a wire. First time, nothing. What you should say is that this is the first time the right men have heard it and knew what it meant. Oh, what does it matter? We started to work on the telegraph, and now we're on the trail of the telephone. Telephone? What's that? It's an apparatus for transmitting the voice. It means sound from afar. Here, here, take this receiver. Alex, where are you going? Going where I'm going to tell Mabel, of course. Telephone. What's the matter? What's happened? I just had to see you, Mabel. I've just discovered the... Mo Mabel! What? Will you marry me? Yes, Alex. Oh, you will? Of course. Oh, well, well, thank you. I... I never had any other intention. Mabel. Alex. What the... Now that you've kissed me, aren't you going to tell me that you love me? Oh, please, I want to hear you say it. I love you, darling. It's 
so dark in here, I can hardly see. Here. Here. Now say it. I love you. Oh, don't move, Alec. Don't even breathe. I, I want to remember this moment all my life, just as it is. And so do I. I want to... Oh. What is it? Oh, I forgot to tell you. The telephone. I, I've got it, Mabel. I found a way to talk to a wire. Alec. That's what I could ask you to marry me. Oh, i, I got to go tell your father. Where is he? No, Alec, no, no. He's in the library reading. Maybe a better way. Oh, no, not me. I'll handle him, darling. You just want... No, uh, Mr. Bell. I'm reading a book, Mr. Bell. Yes, sir, I, I see you are. I allow myself 30 minutes with the classics every evening. In 40 years, I haven't missed three such evenings, except perhaps on my honeymoon. Have it, Mr. Bell. Set a regular time for everything and do it. Uh, yes, sir, but what I wanted to tell you was... Yeah, that... have a cigar. No, no, thank you. If you don't mind, Mr. Hubbard, Mabel and I <clears throat> would like to get married. Mabel and you... Sit down, Mr. Bell. Has my daughter accepted you? Oh, yes, sir. We, uh, we love each other. Well, that always helps. Mr. Bell, may I inquire what prospects you have? Well, I don't, I don't suppose I have any, uh, un unless it's the telephone. The what? The telephone, Mr. Hubbard. This very night, just a little while ago, I made a very valuable discovery. I actually sent sound through a wire without the use of a battery. Sound without a battery? Before long, I'll be able to send speech. Before how long? Well, I, I can't answer that, but someday I know I'll make a telephone. Someday you were going to make a multiple telegraph. Well, I, I'm giving that up, sir. Th this is much more important. Yeah, Mr. Bell, you have many virtues. On the other hand, you are emotionally unstable. Jump from one enthusiasm to another. Do you deny that? Well, uh, the telephone is more important. Yeah, stubbornness is, is another failing. Waste your own time if you wish, Mr. Bell. But the sooner you stop wasting my money, the better. You can expect no more support from me. And, uh, Mabel? What kind of a father do you think I am? Not only will you not marry Mabel, but you will not come to this house again. Mr. Hubbard, please let me show you what I want to have. Twelve minutes after eight. I take a walk every evening. I should have been well past Harvard Square by now. Would you care to accompany me? No, no, thank you. Well, in that case, good night, Mr. Bell. Good night. Well, uh, Alec? He doesn't even want me to see you, darling. Alec? Prospects. I haven't got any prospects. Don't stop your work, darling. Don't stop it for anything or anybody. But don't you see, Mabel, he's right. Your father's right. I said once that a wife would wait, Alec. She still will. Our stars Donna Michi and June Dupre will bring you Act Two of Alexander Graham Bell in just a moment. Now, Barbara is just starting to wash some stockings when... Oh, darn, the minute my hands are wet. Oh, hi, Janie. Come on in. I can't stay a sec. I was just going downtown. Come on out in the kitchen a minute. I'm washing. Well, only a minute. Say, the other day I... My goodness, Dad, do you put stockings in with your wash? Oh, most of these have runs anyway. I wear them around the house. So I see. That's a butte you've got on. Oh, don't rub it in. Three days after I bought them. Where'd you get them? That little shop on the corner of Main Street. And I'll never go there again. Why, that's where I get mine, and I've had these, well, let's see, at least a month. I guess you're just lucky. Maybe. But if you don't mind my saying... Hmm? Well, it could be the way you wash them. Well, what do you mean? Well, that cake soap, rubbing like that. You've got to treat, treat stockings gently if you want them to wear. I always lux mine. Barbara's bound to get more wear from her stockings, too, if she changes to lux. Perhaps twice as much. You see, strain tests have proved that stockings washed with lux flakes last twice as long as those washed with a strong soap or rubbed with cake soap. And these days, stockings are often hard to get, so it pays to give them lux care. Be sure to wash them after each wearing and dry rayons at least 24 hours. You will cut down runs, get extra wear from every pair with Lux. Here's Mitchell Lyson with tonight's stars. And now act two of Alexander Graham Bell, starring Don Amici in the role of Alec and June Dupre as Mabel Hubbard. The passing weeks saw Alexander Bell give to his work everything that a young man has to give. His burning energies, his wild hopes, his last dollar and his health. His reward was an ample and complete measure of failure. Worn out and dejected, he's come now to his friend Thomas Sanders, the father of little George, the deaf mute. I told me he wouldn't be back in town until today, so I took 
George and Nurse to your mother's place in Salem. How is he? Oh, George is fine, Mr. Sanders. But I, I guess it's better if he lives somewhere else than with me. I simply don't understand it, Alec. Well, I've just explained it all. But what could you do to be thrown out of your boarding house? It's what I didn't do. Pay the rent. You get a salary from me. You took my money, built up my hopes, and now you walk out on my boy. That is not so. You could have asked me for an advance. Again? No. Besides, where Watson and I are living now, it's not a suitable place for George. That's the only reason I took him to Salem. Your mother's delighted, and I plan to visit him there the other day. Forgive me, Alec. I, I had no right to get upset. Where can I find you? There's an attic over the Williams Electric Company on Court Street. Well, cheer up, Alec. How's Mabel? I haven't seen her for two weeks. Her father doesn't want me at the house. Sometimes we manage to meet on the street. If I could only... If I could... And you work on the telephone? If I had any sense, I would have stopped long ago. I'm licked, Mr. Sanders. Then give it up. You're killing yourself. Up till now, it's meant too much to me to stop. I'm giving it just one more month. One more month. Goodbye. Goodbye, my boy. But you can't quit, Alec. You can't. I said I'd give it one more month. Watson and I have. I've worked just as hard as I know how. Now I'm through, and I, I don't want to hear any more about it. Well, what are we going to do? I saw your old boss. You can get your old job back any time. And you? I'm going back to teach in the diff. Does Mabel know about this? No. I'm going to write her now. Do we have any writing paper? Where would we get writing paper? Now, here's a piece of writing paper. We have the paper on the floor. I'll write to her on that. What's the date? June the 11th. Alec, listen to me. Will you please keep quiet? I'm trying to write a letter. Come in. Mabel. I can't stay long, Alec. Mother's waiting for me downstairs. Well, does your father... Mother doesn't know I came, and Mother won't tell him if I keep my word and stay only for a minute. Your, your letter just came. Mabel, I Alec, just... you can't give up the telephone. It would be criminal. Well, maybe, but my mind's made up. You think if we love each other, that should be enough? Well, it is for me, darling. Well, it isn't for me, Alec. If you give up your telephone, I promise you, I'll never marry you. I mean it. Yes, I, I think you do. It's up to you, Alec. Mabel, I'll never fail you again. Never. Thank you, Alec. Oh, my darling. <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful if we should invent the telephone and it turned out to be the very thing that could make Mabel hear? If you knew anything about sound, you'd know that can't happen. How do you know? You aren't God. I know because in the human ear, when vibrations strike against the eardrum, they cause tiny bones to oscillate. But in Mabel's case, the nerve current in the back of those bones has been permanently injured. Even if sound waves cause the bones to oscillate, Cause the bones to oscillate. Oscillate? Oscillate. Undulate. Tom. I've got it. I've got it. Got what? The ear. What ear? This. this. Oh, oh, let go. The ear. We hear one. Come on, come on. Get up. We've got to get an ear. It may tell us just what we have to know for our receiver. Oh, you're crazy. Where are we going to get a human ear? Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. I can study about it. The principle of the anatomy of the ear. Only we'll use gold beater skin instead of a membrane. And a piece of metal in front of an electromagnet instead of bones. And we'll use more batteries, a lot more batteries. Well, that's going to take money, Alec. Maybe you could get another address from Mr. Sam. All right. Now. Now, we've had three already. And for less and less work with his little boy. No. Go on back to sleep, Tom. If I wake up in the morning with one ear Go left... Go to I... sleep. Alec, the window. Is that snow? Snow. Tom, you realize it's almost Christmas? Almost Christmas. Christmas. Dinner. It's a great big turkey. I can even smell it. Now yeah, dream about one for me, too. And if you can manage squeezing some cranberries and plum pudding. Oyster and chestnut dressing. Sweet potatoes. Maybe some pickled peaches. Will you shut up? Hey, anybody in there? Open up! Tom, Alec, it's me. Mr. Sanders.
Dandy. Christmas Eve, boys. Come on, Tom, get your coat. My coat? You too, Alec. You're spending Christmas with us out in Salem. Oh, oh we'd certainly like to, Mr. Sanders, but we, we've got a lot of work planned. Hit him over the head, Tom. We'll carry him out. Oh, never mind, never mind. I surrender. <laughs> Hurry now. I've got a slate downstairs. <laughs> Hello, Mama. We're here. Come on in, boys. Oh, oh Merry Christmas, son. Merry Christmas, Mr. Sanders. And this is Tom Watson, Mama. Now, don't try to balk, young man. I'm going to kiss you, too. <laughs> Girl in my arms again. It's wonderful. Where's George? <laughs> He's still awake, dear, waiting for you. Alec, before I go up to George, I have a little surprise. Look, in the parlor. Mabel. Oh, Alec. Merry Christmas, darling. Mabel. And Gertrude. You couldn't come to see her, Alex, so Mr. Saunders arranged this. Father thinks we're in church, poor dear. Oh, there's a Santa Claus after all. There surely is. Oh, you should have seen her when she got here, Alex. Loaded down with presents for everybody, especially you. Oh, you shouldn't have done that, darling. I'm afraid this year I haven't anything for anybody. Alex. <laughs> I wonder what's keeping Alec, Mr. Sanders. Oh, he said he and George had a lot of things to talk about. Is, is George any better? A little, my dear. But I have hopes. High hopes. So have I. Yes. Here now, Tom. Have some more cookies. Well, I don't know. I... Now, don't you tell me you have a bird's appetite. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> a vulture's appetite. <laughs> oh, look. Look, it's Alec. Alec and George. Look who's here. Alec, you mustn't bring him in here. He'll see his presents and the tree. Oh, George and I have something more important. Everybody keep quiet, please. Please keep quiet. I'm going to tell George something, something with our alphabet glove. Alec, what is this? Quiet now. Go ahead, George. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, is he warm enough? Maybe I'd better get a blanket. Hush, uh, Listen, Mr. Sanders. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, 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 Alec. Uh, Alec. Uh, uh, Take Mr. Sanders if he wants you. George. My little boy. And you, Alec. You didn't have a Christmas present for anyone. You all ready in that, Tom? Go ahead. Talk to the transmitter. All right, here I go. Oh, hi, Mr. Watson. I'm speaking to you on the telephone. Thanks to Mr. Sanders, we now have all the acid and batteries we need. But can you hear me? Can you hear me? Only when you yell. Oh, hi, Mr. Watson. This is Alexander Graham Bell speaking to you on March 10th, 1876. Ahoy. Something coming through, Alex. Well, stay there. I'll get some more of this acid. I'll pour it into the... Oh! Tom, Tom, come here. I want you, Tom. Hurry. Alex, it worked. It's Tom. Tom, Tom, hurry, hurry, will you, my leg? I heard you, Alex. I heard your voice. I burned the sand. All the way in the other room. Through the wire, I understood what you said. What? You what? What did I say? Tell me. You said, Tom, come here. I want you. Hurry. Well, that's right. Well, what happened? What did you do? Sulfuric acid in the water. That made the water conductor for the electric current, transmitting the voice. And it worked. Tom is a success. It... Oh! Oh, my leg. Alec. That bottle of acid, it broke. Your britches. You all burned your leg. Sit down. We've got to do something. Yeah, I should say so. Get me some lard and a pair of pants. Father, no father. I'm going to see Mabel. Astounding new discovery. The human voice transmitted 20 miles from... It's Boston. Alexander Graham's Bell Magical New Instrument, the telephone. It's time and space defied. Last night talk. from Lyceum Hall, Salem, Alexander Bell spoke with Thomas Watson in Boston. Scores of reliable witnesses testify to science's newest miracle, Bell's Telephone. <laughs> Incredible, incredible. Why, well, the newspaper says that Mr. Bell claims the human voice can be transmitted as far as wires can be stretched. And listen to this, Papa. On first hearing the telephone, the articulation may seem to be indistinct. But after a few trials, the ear finds little difficulty in understanding the words. Yes, most interesting, my dear. But it's just like Mr. Edward says. Mr. Edward? Yes, the banker. He was present at the demonstration. Mr. Edwards calls the telephone a toy. His advice to his friends is, keep your money in the bank. Well, I suppose Mr. Bell is still in Salem making a show of himself. No, Papa. He wants to see you. Alec and Mr. Sanders are waiting for you in the library. Well, Mr. Sanders, 
this, Mr. Bell? I was in Salem last night, Mr. Hubbard. I saw history being made. It's the most sensational invention of the age. Talking wires. Imagine putting one of those things in your home for women and children to use. That's just what I hope to do, Mr. Hubbard. I've said nothing yet to Mr. Sanders, but since you gentlemen are my partners, I'd like you to draw up the legal papers forming the New England Bell Telephone Company. Did you say partners? You and Mr. Sanders put up the money for experiments. The experiments led to the telephone. I'd like you to share in the return. I gave you money for the telegraph, not the telephone. All I ask is that you help me incorporate Mr. it. Mr. Bell, tomorrow morning, Mr. Sanders and I are going to have our heads examined just for standing here listening to such rubbish. If you don't mind, I've heard enough. Don't worry, Alec. If he doesn't have apoplexy by morning, he'll come along. Well, at least one member of the Hubbard family loves me. Excuse me, Mr. Sanders. I promise to be neighbors. Well, come in, Papa. Oh, thank you. Mr. Bell? Yes, sir? I've been standing at the front door waiting to see you leave. Papa, please. I said you might speak to Mabel for a quarter hour. You've been alone with her exactly 22 minutes. Excuse me, sir, 23 minutes. Mr. Bell, I've just done something I've never done before in my life. I've changed my mind. Papa! You mean Mabel and, and I... I refer to the telephone. Oh, maybe oh. that I'll decide to give you a little uh, support. But, Papa, what about us? What about Alec and me? We're in love. We want to get married. Well, yeah, you're both very young. Perhaps in two or three years, providing Mr. Bell's prospects improve. Prospects again. Meanwhile, I uh, I have no objection if Mr. Bell sees you at this home once a week. Mr. Hubbard, Mabel and I were talking. We agree there is nothing in the world to stop us from running away and getting married. No, Bell. Nothing in the world. Except my daughter's consideration of my feelings. And what I choose to call your own self-respect. I see. I'm good enough for you to share my invention, but I'm not good enough to be your son-in-law. That'll be enough, Mr. Bell. You're right, it will be enough. Mabel, darling, don't worry. We'll find some way out of this. I'll always wait for you, dear. And you. You, you mean old man. I'll see you in my office tomorrow, Mr. Bell. And you'll see me in this house once a week. Just don't forget your promise. And now, whether your father likes it or not, I'm going to kiss you. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye, Alec. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In just a minute, Donna Michi and June Dupre will return in the third act of Alexander Graham Bell. Say, uh, Libby, I thought I'd help you out tonight and dig up some fashion tips myself. Oh, uh, I was going to talk about the new petticoat. That's just what I was going to tell you. Let me see my notes. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, most petticoats are, are now made with a band rather than a yoke, and the full ruffles which extended up the back to give the effect of a bustle are not often used. Casings in which steels are run to be removed when laundered replace these ruffles. Well, that doesn't sound like my information. I was going to say that smart petticoats this spring have ruffled bottoms that match a printed blouse or waistcoat. But what's this about steels? It was written in the spring of 1888. Oh, fine advice that is. A good thing you didn't start giving washing directions from 1888. I guess those petticoats went in the laundry and got plenty of rub-a-dub-dub. Well, they didn't have Lux Blake's then. But no woman needs to risk hot water or strong soap or rough handling now. Those things make pretty undies fade and wear out, even come apart at the seams. Yes, that was proved in actual washing tests, Libby. Slips and nightgowns washed the Lux way stayed lovely looking three times longer than those given harsh wash day treatment. You could hardly tell the Lux ones from new. So why not play safe with pretty colors and fabrics? Use Lux flakes for your under things tonight and every night. Here's Mitchell Lyson returning to the microphone. Our curtain rises on Act Three of Alexander Graham Bell. Don Amici is the young inventor, and June Dupre is Mabel Hubbard. For 12 months, the New England Bell Telephone Company has been in business. It's still far from successful, but at least the 12 months have meant 52 visits with Mabel Hubbard. And Alexander Bell's a happy man. Quite the opposite of Mabel's father, who's glaring now at the telephone company's annual statement. Just look at these figures, Mr. Bell. Look at them. We know them backwards, Papa. I'm talking to him. Do you realize I've let myself in for more than $7,000 while your entire assets amount to... 107 telephone With a net loss of $621. Well, 
Now, exactly what do you intend to do about it? I've got it all figured out. I'm going to England. England? That's right, sir. I just had a letter from Sir William Thompson. He's sure he can arrange a demonstration of the telephone before Queen Victoria. Alice. He says if the Queen installs the telephone in the palace, he feels sure the whole world will follow suit. Oh, that's wonderful, Alec. Of course they and will. And who's going to pay for your pilgrimage to London? Well, sir, I felt as long as you had so much money invested already, you'd like to see it protected. Mr. Bell, I used to call you a fool. I apologize. You're a genius. I'm the fool. Papa, I'm sure we can manage somehow. Did you say we? Yes, Papa. If Alec goes to England, I'm going to marry him and go along. Mabel. Now, just one moment. Father, I'm closing my eyes. I can't see a word you're saying. Well, maybe you're right. Oh, my goodness. Queen Victoria. Mm. Mr. Bell? Yes, uh, uh, Father? You may open my daughter's eyes. Tell me, tell me. Mrs. Bell, you are now looking at a man who just spent 35 minutes with the Queen of England and no further from her than that. Alice. And what is more, Mrs. Bell, I sold her four telephones. In a few days, the whole world will know that Queen Victoria uses my telephone. Don't make you think about going home, can't we? Oh, darling. Don't you want to go to Paris? Alex, this letter came while you were gone. It, it's from Papa. He says that unless a miracle happens, he and Mr. Sanders stand to lose everything they own. Mabel. Somebody has started another telephone company, Alec. They they say their, their telephone is much better than yours. All their subscribers are canceling. The letter, uh, may I see it? Here, darling. A new company called the American Speaking Telephone Company has been organized with the backing of the Western Union. Western Union? They've got millions of dollars, Alec. What can you do? Do? Why fight them, of course. Fight them with everything we've got. Excuse me, I'll go make reservations for I made them an hour ago, dear. We leave tomorrow. I tell you, Alec, it's no use. We have no money. All right, all right. right. I've heard it's all I need to hear. Yes, I saw it by. It's painfully simple and brief, isn't it? We have no more money and we can't borrow anymore. The banks laugh at us, Alec. Then there's no point delaying it any longer. Tomorrow we're bringing suit against the American Speaking Telephone Company, charging infringement of our patent. Fight a $40 million concern, Western Union? Alec, they'll get the best lawyers in the country. What if we lose? The court costs alone would wipe us out. That's a chance we'll just have to take. Well, Alec, I was too young to fight the Civil War, but this looks like as good a fight as any to me. Yes, and just what are we going to fight with? The truth. Well, son, that's always been a pretty good weapon. Maybe more people ought to use it. Come on, let's find us a lawyer. Nelson's American Speaking Telephone Company, New York City, scene of trial. Defense counsel charges Bell obtained patents fraudulently. Bell to take witness stand today. The counsel for the defense may proceed, Mr. Barrows. Your Honor, we charge that Alexander Graham Bell was not the first to invent the telephone. That the patents under which he operated were fraudulently obtained, and third, we defy Mr. Bell to prove that he was working on the undulating current feature of the telephone prior to February 14th, 1876, at which time, by strange coincidence, both Mr. Bell and one of the defendants in this case informed the patent office simultaneously. Now, it is not the intention of my clients to burden this... Then let me ask you this, Mr. Bell. Is it not so that what you call the undulatory feature of the telephone makes the difference between a telephone that works and one that does not? Yes. That's the briefest answer we've had from you since this trial started. Now tell me this. Have you a shred of proof that you were working on the undulatory feature prior to February 1876? Only my word and the word of my friends. I didn't have time to record my findings. And you were not aware that five other men were working along similar lines prior to that time? No, I was not. Very well. You see these papers, Mr. Bell? What are they? I've already identified them. They're rough drafts of my patent application. Ah, yes. And isn't it odd that they refer in no way to the undulating current? I told you before, the features of undulating current were added later when I completed and redrafted my applications. Could they have been added after you filed the application? Certainly not. Then could you have gained access to the patent's office, copied into your application certain paragraphs from another application, filed in the patent's office the same day as your own? Your question's insulting. I refuse to hear it. Answer me. Did you connive to steal the basic principle of your telephone, yes or no? Your Honor, 
counsel for the plaintiff. In the name of decency, I protest against Mr. Barrow's insinuation. Your Honor, all I ask of Mr. Bell is that he produces one single bit of legal evidence to prove his contention. But will he? No, because he hasn't any proof. None exists. Mr. Bell, this court wants you to have every opportunity to establish your claim. If you have any proof, I want it here Monday morning. Until then, this court stands adjourned. Alex, are you sure you have no papers? No sketches? Nothing? Nothing that I know, Mr. Sanders. I've done all I can do. I'm going home. Boston? I got a telegram this morning from Tom Watson. Tom can handle what's left of the business? It wasn't business. Mabel is sick. They think it's a mastoid. Mastoid? I don't know for sure. I've got to go to her. There's a train late tonight. Alex, there's nothing in the world I wouldn't do for my daughter. You know that. At least let me telegraph, Mother, and find out if we're needed. Mr. Vail, as your legal counsel, I must warn you. If you leave this trial now, you'll lose. I'm sorry. I'm going home. Alex! Alex! Wait! Oh! Why did you come here? What, what's the matter? Uh, this came for you, Alex, at the hotel. Another telegram? Yes, from home. I was... I was afraid to open it. Alec, if anything's happened... From Mabel. Oh, she's all right. Feel fine. Mastoid turned out to be minor ear infection. Mother and I are leaving immediately. Don't you dare leave the child. Love. Thank God. Order. Order in the court, please. Have I missed anything, Alec? What's happened? Well, they were having a few minutes recess. Darling, you promised me you'd stay at the hotel. You're unwell, dear. Condition like that, it's still dangerous. Alec, I'm all right. And I thought this, it might be the very evidence they're looking for. Evidence? Did you say evidence, Mrs. Bell? Yes. Alec, it's a letter you wrote me in June 1875. You said you were giving up the telephone. Please, let me see it. Silence in the court, please. I should say this is evidence. Please, I have no intention Wait. of... Wait, these notes on the back of the letter. Excuse me a moment. Your Honor, Mrs. Bell has just brought us the proof the defense has been asking for. Document the undulating current on which his telephone is based long before February 1876. All right. Present it. No, that, that must not be read. Alec. That letter's between you and me, darling. It's part of our personal life. I beg the court's indulgence in just a moment. Alec, it's your proof. I'm sure there's nothing in this letter to be ashamed of. Uh, I'd rather not do it. Your Honor, Mr. Bell refuses to submit the new evidence. Well, Alec, the first and, and I hope the only time in my life I'm going to disobey you. It's my letter, and if you won't read it, I will. Mabel. I won't stand by and see you called a liar and a thief. Darling, you don't understand. I'm closing my eyes, Alec. I can't see a word you're saying. Your Honor, may I take the witness stand? When is the letter dated, Mrs. Bell? June 11th, 1875. Will you read it, please? My dearest one. I know now that above everything in life, I want you. Without you, I am nothing. With you, I am complete. Because this is so, I've decided to give up my telephone. This is little enough to do if it means that I will have your arms about me forever, if I may call you sweetheart and wife. Go on, Mrs. Bell. The telephone will be born someday, somehow. And so far as I'm concerned, I do not care one bit who gets the glory so long as the world gets the benefit. With all my heart, I am yours, Alec. Your Honor. Counsel for the defense. Your Honor, I dare say we have never heard a more tender expression of sentiment. But may I ask what possible bearing a love letter has on whether or not Bell invented the telephone? I can answer that. Mrs. Bell, what kind of paper is that letter written on? It's just ordinary wrapping paper. What's on the back of it? Why, it's a drawing of some apparatus Mr. Bell wanted for his telephone. What else? A stamped acceptance of the order from the Williams Electric Company. It's, it's dated June 3rd, 1875. And this writing here, what is this? And Mr. Williams wrote a note at the bottom asking Mr. Bell to stop in to verify his outline of an, of an apparatus to generate undulating current. Thank you, Mrs. Bell. You may sit down. Your Honor, may I ask where is this Mr. Williams? Surely he's in court to substantiate his handwriting and signature. Unfortunately, he isn't. And why not? Mr. Williams died in Boston three weeks ago. Oh. How very fortunate, Mr. Bell. How very convenient. Coincidence upon coincidence. Your Honor. Mr. Bell. Your Honor, I have sat here and heard myself called liar, thief, fraud, cheat. 
I've seen my friends humiliated. My invention belittled. Just as I've seen my business ruined by methods which must leave every honest man appalled. We protest this interruption, Your Honor. We're here in the interest of truth, Mr. Barrows. I don't think Mr. Bell can do that any great injury. Sit down. Continue, Mr. Bell. Against my wishes, my wife came to this courtroom a little while ago. Also against my wishes, she read a letter intended for her eyes only. I asked that the contents of that letter be ignored because I no longer wished to fight the battle of Alexander Graham Bell. The issue was much greater. Greater even than the millions involved. And there are millions involved, as the guilty cheeks of the defense indicate. Your Honor, I demand this man be declared in contempt of court. I mean to say what I have to say. The issue is simply this. Shall the lonely scientist, the man who dreams, and out of his dreams benefits the world, is he, that often half-starved, lonely little man, to be told that the world has no need of him the moment his work is done? Is he to be told that others, less gifted but stronger... Men with money and power behind them are waiting to take the product of his mind and turn it to their uses, leaving him with, with liar and thief branded upon him as his only reward? Do that and you stop the clock of progress. You smother the one spark of genius that lies hidden here and there throughout the world. Do that and the world stands still. Your Honor! I told you to sit down, Mr. Barrow. Order in this court, please. Is that all you have to say, Mr. Bell? Yes, Your Honor. This case is under advisement. The court is adjourned. Alec, Alec, come here. It's Mabel. What's the matter? Darling, what is... Mabel, all of a sudden she... She collapsed. We've got to get her out of here at once. Well, somebody get an ambulance. An ambulance, quick. Ambulance? But well, there isn't one within 20 blocks of here. You've got a telephone, though, if you know how to use it. Telephone? Where? Quickly, this way. Come with me, Mr. Simon. Doesn't anyone answer, Alec? No, not yet. Ahoy. Ahoy. Keep trying. I will, but, but you better not wait. Get an ambulance. There must be one somewhere. Ahoy, this is Alexander Graham Bell speaking. I want an ambulance. Hurry, please, Mr. Sanders. This fool thing will never work. Ahoy. Ahoy. But why did she bring her back here to the hotel, Doctor? If she's sick, she still belongs in the hospital. She'll be up and around in a few days, Mr. Bell. Just a recurrence of infection, but we've checked it completely. Now go on in there and see her. Don't look so glum. Yes, Doctor. Thank you. I told you you didn't have to worry. We can go home the end of the week, darling. Alex, what about the trial? You haven't told me a word. What's happened? Oh, it's still under advisement, which probably means we've lost. Would you mind so terribly? I wouldn't, but there are others involved. Your father, Mr. Sanders, Tom Watson. Talking about us again? Mr. Sanders! Papa! Do you think you're up to one more visitor, dear? He's waiting outside. Visitor? Yes. The president of the Western Union Company. Well, can't keep him waiting, can you? I'll get him. What does he want? Right in here, sir. Mr. Bell? Mrs. Bell? I must apologize for coming here like this, but your father insisted... Go ahead. Break it to them. Well, Mr. Bell? Yes? The Western Union is ready to admit that you and you alone invented the telephone. What? Yes. We're retiring from the field. The fact is we made a serious mistake in accepting a false report from one of our engineers. After your wife read the letter in court, we made a further investigation. We learned that this engineer not only intended to deny your rights, but injure us as well. Mr. Bell, we're not only willing, but anxious to pay for that mistake. Of course, if you'd consider us as partners, we could offer our wires, rights of way, and other assets. You could. For... Shall we say one-fifth interest? Well, I, I don't know what to say. I ought to warn you, you own what is probably the most valuable single patent ever issued. Well, Alec, the prospects look very inviting. I, I, uh, I better ask my wife. Darling, you know I never interfere with your business. Well, then, uh, I accept. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Splendid. We'll be in Boston in a few minutes, Alec. Yes, home. What's the matter, dear? Aren't you happy? You've everything you wanted and worked for. Yes, darling. And you just keep staring out the window. I, uh, I've been thinking about something. Yes? One day in New York, I walked down to the harbor. I saw a seagull flying, and there was something 
something about the curve of its wings. It just occurred to me that if a bird that's heavier than air can fly, a man might fly too. What did you say? I said if a bird that's heavier than air can fly, a man might fly too. A man might fly? Well, yes. When are you going to start work on it, Mr. Bell? Now that we've given Alexander Graham Bell full credit for the telephone, let's give full credit for a fine performance of tonight's stars, Don Amici and June Dupre. And to June, I'd like to add our heartiest birthday greeting. Oh, so today's your birthday, June. That's right, Don. Well, you ought to take the day off. Wait till she gets a little older and she'll take a year off. <laughs> well, helping Don invent the telephone was a very pleasant way to spend a birthday. I wonder if I'll ever hear the end of Don Amici in the telephone. Well, that's the penalty of being so convincing in the role, Don. <laughs> you know, June, the Army, in the Army, they call telephones Amici's. When are you going to make some more inventions on the screen, Don? Well, I'm scheduled to do the life of Hiram Maxim, the man who perfected the Maxim silencer. Well, that's very logical. First you invent the telephone, and then you invent the silencer. <laughs> Why don't you just pull the phone out by the roots? Well, this Maxim was quite a guy. He also invented something called a rank. A rank? Now, what's that? I don't know. The book said he was an inventor of the first rank. Ooh. Don, to change the subject, uh, you haven't done any inventing in the soap field, have you? You mean in competition with Lux Flakes? Oh, no, no. I never bite the hand that feeds me, even if it's free of dishpan redness. Oh, now, please, Don. Even so, I'm sure our sponsors appreciate that consideration. And right now, I know you will all wish to join me in wishing our sponsors success and happiness on a very special occasion. At this moment in Boston, Massachusetts, the Quarter Century Club of Lever Brothers are having... Lever Brothers Company are having their annual meeting under the genial leadership of their president, Mr. Francis A. Contway. The high percentage of long-service men and women in the Lever family clearly indicates that living under such a chief executive is very pleasant. In the last 30 years, he has brought his company in the United States from modest beginnings to the huge proportions it now enjoys in this, its 50th year of business. I think that many millions of our listening audience as well as those of us here in Hollywood, owe Mr. Conway a very special debt of gratitude because of his far-sightedness and generous judgment in launching the Lux Radio Theater over ten years ago. Certainly millions of us have received grand entertainment over the years from this great institution of the air. Our very best wishes, and I think I may safely say, the best wishes of our vast listening audience go out on this occasion to Mr. Conway and his Quarter Century Club associates, both in Boston and throughout the country. And now let me tell you about the next week's play. From Paramount Studios, next Monday night, we present that deeply moving drama, And Now Tomorrow. And our stars, Loretta Young and Alan Ladd. Here is a story of two fascinating people, a proud, wealthy girl who fights to overcome a stunning handicap, and a man from the wrong side of the railroad tracks who fights to overcome the differences between them. I'm glad it's a bitch, I'll be listening. Good night. Good night, and thanks for being with us. Our sponsors, the maker of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents And Now Tomorrow with Alan Ladd and Loretta Young. This is Mitchell Lyson saying good night from Hollywood. With Germany defeated, many supplies will be released from the European front to strengthen our all-out war against Japan. This is not true, however, of waste fats and greases. The Japanese still control the major natural sources of these products, so essential, so effective to warfare. You must help equalize this disadvantage by saving every drop of waste fat from your kitchen. Don't let this war drag on because of such a small neglect. Save all your waste fats. Take them to your butcher regularly. In return, he'll give you two red meat points plus four cents for every pound. Alexander Graham Bell was presented to the courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studios, producers of the Technicolor feature, Billy Rose's Diamond Horseshoe. Don Amici, who appeared through the courtesy of Standard Brands, will soon be seen in the Jack Skirball production for United Artists, The Guest Wife. June Dupre appears through the courtesy of RKO Pictures, producers of The Enchanted Cottage. Heard in tonight's cast were Tudor Marson, Charles Seal, Francis X. Bushman, Tommy Cook, Dickie Myers, Regina Wallace, that gets me, Myrna Dell, Edwin Rand, Gwen Delano, Stanley Farrar, Herbert Litton, Paul McVeigh, Ferdinand Mounier, Boyd Davis, Griff Barnett, and Norman Field. 
Our music was directed by Laos Silver. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces over through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear And Now Tomorrow with Loretta Young and Helen Lance. <laughs>